Part 1. Meeting the Shadow Loving oneself is no easy matter, because it means loving all of oneself, including the shadow. James Hillman There is a source of energy within us that contains the seed of awakening. We may hide it from others, though we know that it's there. Like fire, if ignored or misused, it may burn us. But if harnessed, it can warm us, protect us, and revolutionize our life. We call it the shadow. Chapter 1. Our Dark and Golden Shadows To own one's shadow is the purpose of life, a full-bodied embracing of our own humanity. Robert A. Johnson the concept of the shadow is found within almost every culture and spiritual tradition the world over, but it was first popularized in the West by the legendary Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. He used it to describe the part of the unconscious mind that was made up of all the seemingly undesirable aspects of the psyche. The shadow is our dark side, but not dark as in negative or malign, rather dark as in not yet illuminated. It is comprised of everything within us that we don't want to face. That is, everything both seemingly harmful and potentially enlightening. All that we have rejected, denied, disowned, or repressed. So the shadow is not evil or bad. It is simply the parts of ourselves that seem incompatible with who we think we are. These might include our shame, our fears, our emotional wounds, and also, crucially, our awakened essence, our unexpressed talents, and our highest potential. While writing this book, I've come across dozens of different definitions of the shadow. From psychologists to shamans, everyone has their unique take on it. Psychologist Stephen Diamond sees it as all that we deem unacceptable and deny in ourselves. Shamanic practitioner Yaakov Darling Khan says it is anywhere that your fear becomes greater than your current capacity for love. Buddhist meditation teacher Rob Nairn calls it all the aspects of ourselves that we don't want to face. The shadow is a wide-ranging term, but in this book we'll use it to refer to anything within us that we are unwilling to either accept or extend our love to. The shadow is a creative powerhouse of untapped energy, so becoming aware of its contents and transmuting its power are hugely beneficial to our psycho-spiritual growth. Although different traditions refer to it in different terms, any spiritual path that aspires to psychological wholeness will incorporate shadow integration to some degree, simply because unless the shadow is integrated, the mind remains divided. The Dark Shadow Many people, when they first hear about the shadow, immediately think about their potentially harmful traits, like anger, prejudice or hatred, or what might be considered unacceptable, such as sexual taboos. Interestingly though, the shadow contains just as many, if not more, overtly beneficial traits, such as inner strength, blinding beauty and talents that have been kept hidden. So, it has two sides, dark and golden. The dark shadow contains the rejected traits that we deem to be negative or harmful, such as anger, fear and shame. It contains the answers to questions like, what am I most afraid of? What am I most ashamed of? And what do I hide from others? The shadow is often misinterpreted as something bad or harmful which leads us to waste the valuable integration process it offers by investing energy in either denying it or trying to defeat it. The truth is, though, that the shadow is neither bad nor harmful. It is simply unintegrated energy. And until we learn how to tap into this energy and transmute its power, we will never become a fully integrated or fully awakened human being. The poet, Raina Maria Rilke, said, Perhaps everything terrible is, 
in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. And so it is with the shadow. Becoming a shadow worker, as you will see, is all about love. The Golden Shadow The golden shadow, often called the positive shadow, is made up of our hidden talents, our blinding beauty, and our unfulfilled potential. It contains our intuition, our creativity, childlike vitality, and spiritual power. Just as the dark shadow is made up of all the parts of ourselves that we fear may lead to rejection, the golden shadow is made up of all the bright, brilliant, and magnificent parts of ourselves that we fear may be too great, too awesome, or too challenging to reveal to ourselves and others. The golden shadow is our unactivated potential, our unused talents, and just as it takes conscious effort to reclaim and transform the energy stored in our dark shadow, so must we make an effort to reclaim the golden shadow's energy if we are to be complete, balanced, and authentically whole. Jungian author Robert A. Johnson has said that to be willing to draw the skeletons out of the closet is quite easy, but to truly own the gold in the shadow can be much more difficult. This is because the golden shadow challenges our self-image. Truly owning our highest potential and waking up to the infinite brightness of our inner light is such a threat to who we think we are that our limited ego mind will often do everything it can to prevent us from doing so. Where do you hide your light or limit yourself? What golden traits are you unwilling to love? Is it your esoteric side that you hide from others for fear of being labelled too woo-woo? I believe that's the technical term for it. Or is it your natural sexuality that you shy away from for fear of being labelled as shameful or too glamorous? Is it your innate intelligence that you temper for fear of seeming too clever? Or perhaps it's the bright light of your spiritual potential that you daren't explore for fear that it might isolate you from your friends or family. Many of us hold the unconscious belief that our golden shadow traits may lead to jealousy, suspicion or rejection if revealed. But, as Marianne Williamson famously said, there is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. To own our golden shadow is to allow ourselves to shine. Dark or Golden The dark and golden shadows are, in fact, different parts and often polar opposites of the same thing. David Richo, in his brilliant book Shadow Dance, describes the dark shadow as a cellar of our unexamined shame and the golden shadow as an attic of our unclaimed valuables. It's only our self-judgment and societal belief systems that make shadow content fall into one category or the other. In some cultures, vivacious individuality would be classed as a dark shadow, whereas in others, it would be classed as golden. The specific culture into which we are born may insist that we behave in a particular manner, obliging us to separate out all our unacceptable traits if we are to be accepted by the tribe. It's interesting to note that it is essentially differences in shadow content between one culture and another that so often contribute to conflict and strife on a worldwide scale. The Shadow of the World Although this book is primarily focused around integration of the personal shadow, it's important at least to address the concept of the collective shadow. Carl Jung spoke not only of a personal unconscious, the aspects of our own mind of which we are unaware, but also of a collective unconscious, a vast storehouse of ancient human experience containing themes and images found cross-culturally throughout history. It is a kind of transpersonal library of the universal history and inherited experience of all humankind, and it also has a shadow. The collective shadow is made up of the dark side of society, fed by neglected and repressed collective values, such as racism, 
taboos and tribally dualistic mindsets. It also holds the repressed, fear-based shadows of the world. War, environmental destruction, human and animal holocausts, and the shadow of our refusal to accept responsibility for integrating these. The personal shadow is the bridge to the global one. So becoming aware of our own shadow keeps us from falling into the mass psychosis of the collective shadow. When we integrate our own shadow, we not only contribute less to the projected chaos of blame, shame and pain in which many human relationships occur, but we also add less to the collective shadow, which fosters conflict on a wider scale. So, the more people who integrate their shadow, the better for the world at large. By shining light into your own unilluminated shadows, you help light the way for others. As meditation master Lama Yeshe Rinpoche says, to tame ourselves is the only way to change the world. Shadow work really can change the world and contribute to a more harmonious society. We are all interdependently linked to millions of other people. And so every change we make, every shadow we integrate, will undoubtedly impact upon the wider world. Let's look at shadow integration a bit more closely. What is shadow integration? Shadow integration can be seen as a process that enables unconscious psychological material to be recognized and accepted by the conscious mind, thus resulting in the beneficial release of that psychological energy into the wholeness of the psyche. But what does that actually mean? It means that we can transmute the unseen power of the shadow into the energy of awakening. This is the purpose of every exercise in this book. Anytime we move from shame to loving acceptance, we integrate a shadow aspect. Anytime we transform a fear or make friends with anxiety, we integrate a shadow aspect. Anytime we are courageous enough to accept, not condone, but accept, the most shameful parts of ourselves. Anytime we choose love over fear, and anytime we step into the fullest expression of who we are, we integrate our shadow. By consciously illuminating and befriending our shadow material, we release the energy that it contains, lighten the load of our shame, and manifest our highest potential. To look into our dazzling darkness and embrace our shadow with love is to move into the fullest expression of ourselves. It is crucial to remember that shadow integration is not about getting rid of the shadow. We want to harness its energy, not destroy it. And yet, our aim is not to act it out or indulge it either. This will simply solidify its separation from us. Instead, we want to befriend it and transmute its energy into benevolent power. This radical approach to dealing with the dark side is not new. For over 1,000 years, practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism and other mystical traditions have been intentionally confronting the forces of fear, aggression and desire so that the practitioner can channel them into the creative expression of spiritual awakening. Full integration of our shadow is integral to full enlightenment. The end goal is to know ourselves and to witness where everything within us lies, both the best and the worst of us. We then make friends with those parts and harness the energy that they hold to fuel the fire of spiritual transformation. Shadow Dreaming If you want to know your shadow, it helps to know your dreams. The themes, characters and symbols of our dreams are often used by our unconscious mind to highlight areas of ourselves of which we are unaware and which require integration. Shadow material forms a large part of this. When we dream, the shadow, both dark and golden, can be displayed openly and without the censorship of the waking mind. So if we open up to our dreams, we are opening up to the shadow. Our shadow actually wants to be known, and so it will display itself in our dreams in the hope that we will recognize it, because through that simple act of recognition, it will begin to be integrated. 
dreaming of themes related to our shadow is actually a very good sign. But when the dark shadow displays itself at maximum volume, we may label the experience a nightmare and, in our aversion, miss the opportunity to recognize and integrate it. In chapter 8, we will start to reframe this aversion. Throughout this book, we'll be learning all the techniques we need to start remembering, recognizing, and even directing our dreams. Through lucid dreaming, the art of becoming fully conscious within our dreams, we'll be able to invoke our shadow, dialogue with it in personified form, and even embrace it as a way of transmuting its energy. We'll devote two whole chapters to lucid dream shadow work, and there are lucid dreaming techniques in the appendix. So don't worry if you don't know how to lucid dream yet. If you're wondering exactly what a lucid dream feels like, then take a moment to have a listen to some of the lucid dreams in Appendix 2. Lucid Living – Live the Life of Your Dreams If lucid dreaming is about becoming fully conscious in our dreams, then lucid living is about becoming more conscious in the shared dream of waking life. Most of us live as we dream, in the shadowy darkness of non-awareness. So much of our life is lived this way. We sleepwalk through relationships, are too tired to activate our potential, and make crucial life choices with sleep in our eyes. Lucid living is about taking charge of our waking life in much the same way as we take charge of our lucid dreams. As we take back the reins of our life and live more lucidly, we embrace the shadow elements of daily life fearlessly and work through psychological blocks more creatively. Shadow work is the ultimate lucid living practice in that it asks us to wake up and become conscious to everything within us that we have been denying and rejecting. The practices in this book encourage us to wake up and to start dreaming through the darkness and into the bright light of our fully lucid state. Essentially, every time we embrace a shadow aspect in our dreams, we are planting seeds to do the same in our waking life. Through this, we open up the possibility of quite literally living the life of our dreams. For as we learn to become lucid at night, we find our level of dream awareness being reflected in our waking life too. And with that, we begin to dream our life into existence. Now that we've covered the basics of what the shadow is and touched on how shadow integration works, let's take a look at some of the benefits of shadow integration.